In a book entitled Christianity's Dangerous Idea, author Alistair McGrath argues that the right of everyone to read and interpret the Bible for himself is Christianity's most dangerous idea. McGrath is a professor of historical theology at Oxford University in England and because of his background is really talking about Protestantism and not Christianity in general. His point is that Luther and Calvin as well as other reformers of that period unleashed a movement within Christianity that once began was hard to control even by the religious leaders of the times. The danger in Protestantism was the notion that if everyone could read and interpret the Bible for themselves, how do we decide who has the right or correct interpretation? He cites the fragmentation of Protestantism into many denominations of today as proof that once this dangerous idea of personal interpretation was let loose, there was nothing to stop it. Now as a historian, he doesn't offer any solutions to the problem. He simply describes it, its historical evolution from Luther's break with the Catholic Church to the now thousands of religious groups that each claim to be Christians and hold the truth of the Bible with their particular uh, group. Now I don't suggest that I have an easy answer to the question, who has the correct interpretation of the Bible? After 39 years of preaching and teaching uh, ministry, my best answer is that, well, each group has some of it right, some of it wrong. Some have it more right than wrong. I suppose the critical difference is that some groups are continually searching, and I hope that's us, and others have simply codified their opinions into dogma. I hope that's not us. But whether or not one's group interpretation of the Bible is superior to another group's opinion, this is not Christianity's most dangerous idea. It may be Christianity's greatest obstacle to unity and peace, but this idea threatens no one except the unity of those who believe in Jesus Christ. Christianity, however, does have a dangerous idea, one that threatens to turn the entire world upside down if it's preached. Here it is. Are you ready? Drum roll. Thank you, Bobby. I knew that was going to happen. There it is. Jesus Christ is God. That's Christianity's dangerous idea. Don't get it wrong here. Not that he developed into God, not that he is like God, not that he is godly, not that he's a prophet sent by God, not that he is one of many gods, not that he personifies God, but the basic interpretation held by most believers in the world that Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph and Mary, the Jesus described in the Bible is God himself the supreme being, the creator of heaven and earth, the only true and eternal God. Jesus Christ is God equal to the Father and the Holy Spirit. Paul alludes to this in Colossians when he says he is before all things and in him all things hold together. That passage can only describe God and Paul is referring to Jesus here. Thomas, the apostle who saw Jesus after his resurrection proclaimed, my Lord and my God, John 20, 28. Jesus himself made reference to this reality when he said, the Father and I are one, John 10, verse 30. And in witnessing to the Jews about his true eternal nature, Jesus also said, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am, using a name for God to describe himself, John 8, 58. And so Christianity's most dangerous idea is its most basic, that along with the Father and the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ is God. 
This is an extremely dangerous idea for several reasons. Really? Yes. Why is this dangerous? Well, a couple of reasons. Number one, if Jesus is God, all other religions are mistaken or false. <laughs> yeah, think about that for a minute. Do you see the danger here? Why do you think Christians were martyred in the first and second century? They've been martyred throughout history, but especially in the first and second century. Not for their good works, not for their moral lives they, they lived, not for their style of worship. They were killed because they refused to worship the gods of their government. They were considered traitors to the empire and the emperor uh, whose worship was demanded of them in their day. Today, to openly say that only Jesus is God is not a crime yet but it is politically and socially unacceptable. Why? Well, those who have no religion or no God are offended because they feel you are judging them and have no right to judge them. And other religious groups are offended because in saying that uh, you are saying that their gods are not gods at all and that their religion is false. And society in general likes all religions to be equal because it's easier to ignore them when opposite religious ideas have exactly the same value. If both Hinduism and Christianity have exactly the same worth, then together they're not worth anything. That's why society likes to kind of even out all the religions. It's society's existential way of dealing with religion. If it's good for you, then go for it, so long as you don't you know, impose it on me. And of course, within the broad area of Christianity, this dangerous idea mustn't be shouted out too loudly because we don't want to upset the status quo. If people who attend our churches knew that this is what we really thought, they would assume we're radicals, we're rebels, we're zealots, we're fundamentalists, and they might leave. This is a dangerous idea because most Christians want peace, not war. We want a smooth ride, we don't want to rock the boat, we don't want to become victims of ridicule, we do not want to be marginalized, we don't want to be rejected by those we admire in the world and be attacked by other religious groups. We want people to love us, to accept us. And if this dangerous idea gets out, we'll be persecuted and we don't want any of that. Another reason why this, you know, that Jesus is God is a dangerous idea. If Jesus is God, then he will judge me whether I agree with this or not. <laughs> you see, the thing about God well, he's absolute. There's nothing he cannot do. There is no one greater. He, his rules are the only rules that count. This position creates a huge problem because aside from other religions, there are thousands, no millions of people out there writing books and doing seminars and hosting TV shows with the sole purpose of telling me how to live my life without any reference to Jesus. That Jesus is God is a dangerous idea to me personally because it makes me accountable to Him first. Ah yes, I, I'm responsible for my family and my job, my community, even myself, but this dangerous idea changes the order of these things and it puts Jesus first, even before myself. If this idea is true, then Jesus is my judge, then His teachings and His commands make up the framework of my life. His person requires my allegiance. After all, He's God. The danger for everyone is that we no longer belong to ourselves and are accountable to ourselves or live to please and satisfy just ourselves. This idea threatens the loss of self, 
the submission of our will, the subjugation of our ideas and plans for His will and His plans and His character to replace our own. This idea is extremely dangerous to Western man because our entire society is conditioned to pursuing happiness and freedom as we see it, not as God wills it. It's a dangerous thing to proclaim that our freedom is really slavery to sin and our happiness will only come if we surrender to another. And then finally, the notion that Jesus is God is a dangerous idea because we cannot control it. We can't control the idea and we can't control him. Going back you know, to Professor McGrath's book for a moment, he describes how Luther and others tried to stem the growing number of new groups that were unleashed by the promotion of the idea that each should read and be responsible for the Bible uh, for themselves. Once the idea was out, they couldn't take it back, nor could they control this idea. It just got away from them. People began reading the word and it had an effect upon them, more powerful than any Luther had ever imagined. I can testify to that myself in my own life. People always say, oh, you grew up in Quebec. You know, Quebec, when I was a kid, 99% Catholic and you, you, know, you were an altar boy and you went to seminary and you went to Catholic school and you taught Catholic. How did you ever, you know, how did you ever become a Christian, a New Testament Christian? How did ever, there were no even churches of Christ. How did you become a Christian? And I have only one answer to that. I started reading the Bible. <laughs> yeah. And I was mad for at least two years after being baptized. Why? Because I'd read the scriptures and I said, well, they never taught me that. Well, they never showed me this. Well, that, we used to do that and that, right here it says that that's wrong, you know, and so on and so forth. You see, that's the thing about dangerous ideas. They're dangerous because they can overpower you and create a new order of things not even imagined by those who first introduced them. If Jesus is God, then He controls the agenda of the world, of the church, of my life. And my recognition of this can have a powerful effect on me. For example, if Jesus is God, everything He and His inspired apostles said about the world and its condition and ultimate end is true. He said through the apostle Paul that the world will end suddenly when He returns to judge all who even who ever lived, 1 Thessalonians 5.2. No need to put my hope in this place. Better to invest myself in being ready for His return. I mean, if He is God and if this is what's going to happen, Investing myself into this world you know, yields not much. If Jesus is God, then He is the head of the church, and so the church should be about honoring and serving Him, not fighting about who's got the right doctrine. The most powerful thing about this idea is that if, if, if you believe that Jesus is God, then He will ultimately reveal Himself to you completely, and when He does, all of your opinions and interpretations will finally be clarified by what is completely true about Him. Paul speaks of this when he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I'm wondering if I've got a slide, yeah. He says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I also have been fully known. Churches should focus more on proclaiming and disseminating and circulating this powerful truth about Jesus in any way they can, because this is their basic task. And in doing so, they turn on the only light that can illuminate this dark world. Infighting between groups, solidarity meetings between denominations, debates over issues, this sheds no light and does not demonstrate the power of any kind. It actually shows our weaknesses. Declaring that Jesus is God, the only true God, may produce dangerous consequences for the church, 
But Jesus, who is God, said the following, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. The church cannot overcome the world without declaring boldly the dangerous idea which is at the core of its beliefs. And that is that Jesus is God. And then finally, if Jesus is God, then I must change. I won't change because of global warming, whether I believe that or not. I won't change to please my parents or even to do what is right. And if Jesus is not God, then I am God. And I will do as I please, as I want, as my heart leads me for good or evil, because I am the boss of me if Jesus isn't God, because I'm God. I'm going to do what I want to do. No one will tell me what to do. Does that sound familiar? However, if I let this dangerous idea that Jesus is God into my personal life, if I accept the evidence about who Jesus is, then I am no longer the God of me. I am no longer the one who decides. I'm no longer the center of my own universe. Jesus Christ is God, not me. And if Jesus Christ is my God, then my life and all I have become His for His purpose and His will. If Jesus is God, I must surrender my will to His will. There is no other way. What I do today, tomorrow, and for all of my life will be to try and know and do His will. Anything less or different will be a gross hypocrisy. That is, if Jesus is God, so I've put you in a dangerous position today. I didn't tell you to you know, put on your seat belts before this sermon. You see, now you know. If you've not thought about this before or you're visiting with us here, you now know what we're about and what we believe here at the Choctaw the Church of Christ. You may be challenged to choose, even this morning, which side you're on. Are you on the side that says Jesus is God or some other lesser position? We might see you next week or never again based on your decision. Now, if you already believe this to be true about Jesus, that He is God, then my question is, what's holding you back from doing what He has told you to do? If Jesus is God, then repent and continually seek to do away with sin in your life because God says that you and I should be doing this. And be baptized, in other words, be immersed in water to demonstrate that you believe that He is the Son of God. And continue to immerse yourself into His word, immerse yourself into His service, His worship, His praise, His person, His spirit, you know, obedience is dangerous because it means no turning back, no second guessing, no bargaining. He went to the cross for you, you carry your own cross for Him. That's the way it works in Christianity, if Jesus is God. And of course, if you're a Christian leader, a believer with many years as a disciple, then you should be leading the charge in proclaiming Christianity's dangerous idea. I don't mean everybody needs to be a pulpit minister. You lead the charge wherever you are. Wherever you are, you're leading the charge and letting the people around you know that Jesus is God. You know, churches are always looking for ways to grow, to mature, to be renewed spiritually. They try seminars and retreats and building projects and social activities with various degrees of success but nothing jump starts the growth and spiritual life of a church or an individual more than seeing its leaders on the dangerous edge of proclaiming to the world that only Jesus is God, only Jesus is God. If you're one of those experienced Christians, ask yourself, when was the last time you took a risk for Jesus? When was the last time you even suffered inconvenience 
or fatigue in his service. If Jesus is God, it's wrong to be silent. It's sin to be lazy in ministry. It's dangerous to avoid making a witness for this truth. One last but very important thing. If the Bible is true, if Jesus is God, if faith, our faith is justified, then those who are in danger will not be us, it'll be those who rejected Jesus as God. Those are the ones who are in danger. Paul writes about this in 2 Thessalonians. He says, this is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. Who, who is suffering? The people who have been acknowledging that Jesus is God in their society. He says, for after all, it is only just for God to re repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed, for our testimony to you was believed. Rest assured, rest assured, that this is a promise that Jesus, who is God, will definitely keep. So based on all we've looked at today, I encourage anyone here who has not yet confessed their faith in Jesus to do so without delay by repenting of your sins, by being baptized in His name, by being renewed. Maybe you've had it up here in your head, yeah, intellectually I know Jesus is the Son of God, I guess, you know. But if you've been convinced in your heart and in your soul today that this is true and this will now be the guiding principle of your light, life, rather, and you have not allowed this to happen in your life until now, maybe you need to repent. Maybe you need to be restored to an active, faithful position in Christ. Whatever your need, our elders are here, the ministers are here, the church is here to hear your confession of Christ, to pray for your needs, whatever they are. Please come forward now as we stand and sing.